My name is Wendy Pullen, and I'm going to be chairing uh, the, the events this evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I realize that it's probably a fairly mixed audience, um, people who are very, very much steeped in, in the study of, of cities or the practice of, of dealing with cities, and, and some people um, perhaps with a more casual interest. So I think what I'd like to just begin with is, is by saying that the provocation for um, the, the discussion this evening and the film that we're going to see uh, is the Habitat 3 conference that was held in Quito in October of 2016. Um, I mean, this is a major event. Habitat has, has these conferences only once every 20 years. Um, now, the, the Quito papers, um, which, which is, is, I think, how the, the um, event this evening is, is, is being described, um, is, is a somewhat um, uh, central event from Habitat 3, but not part of the, of, of the um, formal government um, uh, procedures that were held in Quito. Um, it was a research collaboration between Teatro Mundi and, and, and UN Habitat, um, developed in the run-up to, to the events, and it was something that was instigated by Richard Sennett and by Dr. Joan Klos, uh, the Director General of, of UN Habitat um, and, and the Chair of the, um, of, of the, of the conference. Um, I think it's probably worth saying just a, a very few words on the Charter of Athens, um, because that is what prompted the present work to, to develop. Now, the Charter of Athens was, was, was um, formulated in 1933 um, by a group called SIAM, and it was a def an attempt to define modern cities and to illustrate what was important about them. Um, so many of the planning um, uh, ideals that were developed at that point are something that we see in our cities today. So um, uh, uh, things like suburban development, cluster housing, emphasis on the automobile, standalone buildings in large open spaces, the separation of functions. I mean, things that we're very familiar with in our cities today were developed in that document in 1933, and then it was finally published in 1943 by Le Corbusier. Um, and, and this you know, has really become a benchmark for us. However, I think as cities have, have developed in more recent times, we see that there's many, many problems with these, these particular ideas, and we really need to rethink them and to readdress them. And so if the Charter of Athens focused on the cities of the future, um, the Quito Papers begins with the idea that the future is urban. And I would say that's quite a different idea, and our speakers tonight are going to, to, to tell us about that. Now, if you're in any doubt that the future is urban, and I'm not going to talk about statistics or anything, simply turn on the news. What we are seeing across the US across the UK, in many other cities in the world, are urban demonstrations. People are taking to the streets in order to demonstrate against what they're very unhappy about. And right at this moment in time, there are rather a lot of things to be unhappy about. And I think what's interesting for us is that we're seeing quite a lot of this over the past years. There was the Arab Spring, um, there, there was the Occupy movement, and now um, what we're seeing in recent days. People have talked about the importance of mobile phones, social networking, that that has been the main impetus between these sorts of demonstrations. Well, I would say that actually still the main end of impetus is the fact that people go to the center of their cities and they demonstrate. Place matters, and that's going to be one of the main themes for, um, for this evening. Now, I think at this point, I would just like to uh, make a few acknowledgements. Um, 
that, uh, first of all, we're going to be seeing a wonderful film. I have seen, seen it already, and, um, and that will be a real pleasure for us this evening. Um, the, the film is called The Quito Papers, Towards the Open City, directed by Dom Bagnato and Kasim Shepard. And it was made possible by the Kaifeng Foundation. Uh, Teatro Mundi, which is the host tonight, is based in, in the LSE Cities program and is, is uh, in New York University, um, and uh, has been sponsoring events like this in various cities in, in the world. Obviously, the first one was Quito. There was, it was a, a similar event in Paris. Here, uh, New York, Shanghai, and so on. So th this will be really a, a, a roving show um, um, uh, across, uh, across the world. LSE Cities is an international center supported by Deutsche Bank's Alfred Herrhausen Society. Now the program for this evening is that we will see, see the film. We will have quite brief presentations um, <laughs> by, by our three speakers, um, a, a panel discussion, and, 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 and then a question and answer um, period at the end. And I think what I'd like to do right now is because the presentations are quite brief, I just want to um, tell you very quickly about the speakers. I think many of them will be well known to, to, to a lot of people in the audience, um, but I'd like to do that uh, at the beginning so I, that I don't have to interrupt them. Richard Sennett writes about cities and about labor. He's professor of sociology at the London School of Economics um, and visiting professor of, of architecture in Cambridge University. Um, he is currently completing a trilogy of books about craftsmanship, the third volume of which is called Making and Dwelling, and it's about the crafts of urban design, and we're very much waiting for that book. <laughs> Saskia Sassen is Robert S. Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia University and co-chairs its Committee on Global Thought. Um, now, she has a book that, that is, is, all, is out from 2014 with Harvard University Press, um, and this is called Expulsions, Brutality, and Complexity in the Global Economy. And Richard Burdett, is Professor of Urban Studies at, at the LSE and the Director of, of the LSE's um, Cities and Urban Age Program. Um, he's trained as an architect and his research interests focus on the interactions between the physical and social worlds in the contemporary city. And he was the founder of the Architecture Foundation and Director of the Venice Architecture Biennale. So, I think um, without further ado, we would like to see the film and, um, and then we'll move on from there. Okay. Thank you. The definition of the city that I like most is the definition that says the city is the place where you find what you are not looking for. A city is a complex but incomplete space. Well, the thing that distinguishes a city from just a place which has got lots of people living close together is that those different groups interact. Most people making decisions in cities don't get it. So I think we've got a long way to go in terms of bringing a whole new field that understands the social processes and the physical process at the same time.
l'environnement favorable nécessitant donc des cadres juridiques adéquats. Document that in front of all of us, the new urban agenda. Different countries have different realities and demands. Cities are going to take the action because governments are sclerotic with Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The presentation tonight really touches, as you can see, on three massive themes of importance for Habitat 3, which is how do you actually design cities in the wider sense of the word, not just physical design, but governance, and also how does one relate to environmental, ecological, social, and um, <coughs> economic issues. Hablar de la ciudad hoy no es solamente hablar de la ciudad, es hablar de una masiva, una pérdida masiva de habitat. El futuro no está predeterminado. No estamos castigados a tener mala ciudad de una forma determinística. Two and a half years ago, uh, one close and I were uh, having a drink, and I asked him, uh, "Have you read the Charter of Athens?" This enormously influential document. To explain the Charter of Athens, which was more or less conceived in 1933 on a great ship going across the Mediterranean, you've got to probably go back a little bit more to understand context. The early part of the 20th century was thought of as the machine age. New forms of production were coming into process, affecting everyone's lives. The car was beginning to dominate the way we moved around in cities and in the world. They had a dream. And that dream was that a city could be organized to work like a beautiful machine. We've got to remember that then, in the 1930s, the city was seen as overcrowded, dark, and actually negative in terms of, of well-being. So if you believe in the machine age, if, if you believe in rationalist principles, what you do, you clean it up. And you do that by taking all the different functions and separating them out. You put people to sleep there, and you put people to work there, and you go and entertain yourself there. You connect them by nice motorways with cars. That's a view of what Le Corbusier imagined for Paris, making the city as a machine, putting people in towers, and having a cruciform shape so that you could get fresh air and improve the health of the people there. What was actually ruined in that process was the street, was the continuity and the sense of cohesion. The problems today that we have uh, in urbanism is that we design cities to be closed in the sense that there, there's a tight bond between form and function in how people experience the city. I would say that most of the principles of the 30s charter are still quite dominant. The notion that there's a CBD somewhere, a central business district, then out there, there are towers of housing, all linked by large freeways and motorways. But those more or less are the principles of the Charter of Athens from 70 years ago. Even though arguments about sustainability, arguments about social cohesion, arguments about integration really should be taking the city in the opposite direction. Confronted with some of these trends, I like to ask who owns the city? In the city, those without power can stand up and say, we're present, that this is also our city. That is to me what marks the city, and that is why mere built up density is not a city, and we need to protect that distinction.
a successful public space has to bring people together. There has to be fizz of interaction. Once we accept that in the city, to have a decent life, we, we require a lot of commons. Huh? That the public land ends up being something between 60 or 70% of the total land of the city, which is very counterintuitive to the ones that they think that the market is governing urbanization. Uh, what governs the quality of a good urban life is the provision of, of public uh, land. The beginning of creating an open city is to protect the public realm as something that belongs to the public, to, to resist the privatization of public space. Most of the public space in most cities is streets. It's a common good. Under kind of neoliberal capitalism, we've lost the notion that the public belongs to the public. The last 30 years, what we see is the rise of logics of extraction, away from the dominance of mass consumption, which meant that even the most aggressive corporation or bank was interested in the sons and daughters of the middle classes doing better than their parents. When you switch to the dominance of a logic of extraction, none of that matters. It's very difficult for the private uh, owner to understand that the provision of public space is fundamental and, in fact, generates private value. The market is not a good urban planner. When you see that the dominant logic is a logic of extraction, that means concentration, concentration, concentration. So this particular period has generated its own undoing, because in the end, you keep extracting, there's not much left. The public realm is not something that simply can be reduced to profit and loss. The Charter of Athens model is of great interest to the private sector in terms of promoting uh, land investment or speculation. It's a very easy way to deal with cities uh, rather than this messy, organic, integrated way that we might find in pre-existing cities that have been there a long time and require much more negotiation. Expansion of cities is important as long as they're well-planned. Well-planned doesn't mean making an instant perfect city. It means providing the infrastructure of a messy and incremental city. Unless you get the physical infrastructure right, you don't get the potential for equity right. The question of the equitable city is a difficult one. How can we make an intervention that alters the dominance of this logic of extraction? So for me, one of them is the importance of relocalizing pieces of the economy that today are basically exist as, as elements of franchises. So my rhetorical question there is always, do we really need a multinational corporation to have a cup of coffee? We need to find the way that whatever the consumption capacity of these modest neighborhoods, which is most of the neighborhoods in the world, whatever it is, we should maximize its recirculation. This permanent uh, effort to make the city a, a just place, uh, where, where every innovation is not owned by a, a minority, and, and, and denied to the rest, or, or used by a minority to, to make more money. 
There are lots of things we can do to bring an open city into being, to overlay different kinds of functions in the city so that they synergize. The political classes, they need to enable a better distribution of the wealth that is getting produced. Because the mechanisms that lead to concentration at the top, we made those mechanisms. They did not fall from the sky. We altered the law. Those were critical decisions that were made in legislatures, that were made by the executive branch, that were made by judges, that were made you know, in a variety of settings. That needs to be changed. Going in the opposite direction from the Charter of Athens actually means understanding what density, complexity, and overlapping of different functions so that you have something happening in the city at different times of day and night for different people, the open city, not a closed walled place where people of difference can't come together. The open city is based on the notion that an environment becomes in more and more complex. And how do you manage it rather than try and simplify it? There are three basic concepts behind this. One is, as Richard Sennett calls it, the openness of a city. How open can you make a city? In other words, not close it down for different distinct groups who never mix. The second is Sask Assassin's argument, which is about ownership. Who owns the city? How do we actually give it back to different constituents and not give in to what is now the, the trend in many cities around the world of large companies, corporations, taking over major chunks. And thirdly is, I guess, my contribution to the discussion, which is that design really matters. It's not just a question of planning. It's not just a question of zoning and regulations. It's the quality. It's the section of the street. How wide a street? How tall are the buildings? The reason for opening up the city is ultimately that this is how you keep a place alive. Well, I want uh, first to thank um, Kasim Shepard and Dom Vignato for making this film, uh, which there's little more to be said, but since we're here, I'll say it uh, about it. Just as a personal background to how uh, this came to be, uh, I've known Juan Close for a long time, and the way people, old friends are, you know, they feel free to, to complain and bellyache to each other. And one of his belly aches to me one night here in London, um, you know, do you all know that bar in Casey Street, that sleazy bar in Casey Street? You should, 53, it's Casey Street. It's a wonderful place to sink into gloom, because it's a gloomy place. And he said to me in this very degraded bar, he said, you know, I'm." Uh, I, I'm an advisor in UN Habitat, advises the World Bank formally uh, and advises rather informally the IMF on uh, uh, loan projects. And everything I'm seeing looks backward. It looks backward to a kind of planning which is very functionalist, which looks like the Plan Voisin, which you saw up there, Cabousier with his hand and so on. Uh, nice isolated towers in a park uh, that uh, tries to get rid of complexity and simplify things for economic reasons, and I'm sick of it. It all looks like building the past with the money of the future. And um, out of that, uh, we started thinking about a way of, as Wendy puts it, 
looking at a future which would be much more open than, uh, than the kinds of practical projects that he was being pitched day after day of a boringness and a, uh, a, a kind of completeness which allowed for no possibility of growth and were very low at the level of including people who, like the people you see in the film, who don't have the economic resources to enter into those projects. And later tonight, uh, Ricky Burdett will show you much, in much more detail what that kind of closure actually looks like in the making of urban env environments now. The reality is that the city is closed as far as capitalism is concerned. And the point of this project uh, is to open it up and to find another way of seeing the city. I'm going to talk to you really briefly about four points uh, that concern this. The first is the definition between open and closed. Uh, and I think of it in my book, my forthcoming cheap uh, book, which will be in all bookstores soon, uh, in terms of uh, an experience I had at MIT. My office, I taught at MIT for many years, my office was next to the Media Lab, which in those days was a place filled with uh, programmers who never seemed to sleep, littered with pizza boxes, you can imagine. And uh, I'd occasionally wander in, have a slice of pizza, and talk to people about what they were doing. And they told me, look, here's the difference between in an experiment, between an open and closed experiment. And a closed experiment is one where you have a hypothesis, you test it, it's either true or false, you, either, you come up with a, uh, with a finding which uh, you say is robust. Uh, whereas an open experiment is one in which you're testing something, you get distracted, you fail, you don't know what to do, or you discover in solving a problem a new problem that you didn't know was there before. That's an open experiment. Uh, my colleagues next door said, well, the first kind of experiment is, that's uh, uh, embodied by kind of the way Microsoft things. You should know that Microsoft was paying for the Media Lab. Whereas the second kind of experiment is a Media Lab experiment. The one is a way of thinking open and experimentally, and the other one is a way of thinking uh, in more in Boolean logic, uh, falsification and, uh, and the certification of knowledge. Uh, I have taken the Microsoft version, I'm sure Microsoft would hate this, but I've taken the Microsoft version of this as a certain way of making cities. That is where you know what you're getting. It's the way all developers have to work. They have a product, they commission what the product is about, it's delivered, and the object sits there, inert, made. Uh, an open way of making a city is much more experimental. And what we're losing in urbanism today is the capacity to make more experiment in the way our cities are run, designed, and also lived in. Uh, in that regard, I'd like to secondly, just make a, oh, and I should say about this, that my cheap, inexpensive, wonderful book is based on the notion, which is really a notion developed, that I first developed, at MI, I learned about at MIT, of open systems theory. Basically, in my view, what we need to do today is apply and transform open systems theory, such as produce so many wonderful innovations for us technologically into the domain of urbanism. <coughs> and that's, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I, um, I can barely add two and two, but, but that's another story. 
The second thing I'd like to say about this, which is peculiar about the Charter of Athens, it can be demonized, uh, these functionalist architects, as a kind of proto-capitalist uh, uh, logic of building. But they themselves were socialists, and their notion is that socialism grows to the extent that society becomes more functional. And that for us here at the LSE is something really to ponder because this is a place that in making, for instance, the beverage report or other aspects of the welfare state, after the Second World War, as with before the war with Fabian socialism, made the same assumption that the more functional a society is, the more just it is in socialist terms. The more it redistributes, uh, the more equal it is, uh, and so on. And when you look at that application of this notion of this, the socialist is the functional in the concrete terms that produce something like uh, the, the, the uh, Plan Voisin, or these ver the very functionalized cities, it maybe gives us to think about other versions of what socialism should be like. Should it really be the pursuit of efficiency, of order? Or should it be about something which is the pursuit of complexity, of ambiguity, even of disorder. And what an open systems theory argues, in, at least in the mathematical world, is that the, what opens the system is precisely the elements which destabilize and denormatize, uh, if you like, a system of predictable outcomes and uh, uh, redistributions. I think for anyone here, in the ambience of what the LSC is, it's worth pondering that these urban designs have an implication for thinking about what we want in terms of social theory. What I want is a more complex society, and that entails more disorder. That's a fundamental principle I would say, in terms of social theory, of an open city. The third point I'd like to make to you, uh, Wendy, I will go quickly, I'm racing along, is that there is an asymmetric relationship between making and dwelling. That is to say, the limits that we have as uh, makers are um, put it here, that the limits we have as makers sometimes are imposed by the way people want to dwell. I think of this in something very, very important in wearing my UN hat, which is that we are constantly pressured to make uh, um, gated communities. That's what people want money for, dominantly. Places that are controlled, uh, which are safe, which means excluding people who are uh, unlike those who live within them. So tremendous pressure for that, not just among developers, but also among many urbanites themselves. It's the notion that people who are different can't live together. Should we as makers succumb to that? I don't think so. I think we have to refuse the idea of making a gated community. That sets us against uh, desire, against the desire to dwell in a certain way. Another way to put this is that making matters, that there's a kind of independent vector of ethics in the maker's world which may not sync, synchronize well with the ethics of the way people live. I should say that this is a debate I had many, many years ago with my mentor, Jane Jacobs, who believed always that the path of making something 
was the path of realizing the people's desires. If I put this in contemporary terms, what's wrong with that is that I would never build something for the followers of Donald Trump. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. I would confront them with a design which made them think about how they wanted to live. But in a certain kind of urbanism which took form in the 1960s in reaction to the Charter of Athens, this functionalist uh, thing, uh, was that the people speak and the maker follows. And today, I think we have to take another step beyond that. We have to have the courage, ethically, not to be populist. And that is a domain in which conflicts, again, between uh, maker and dw uh, dweller can arise, but it's again, it makes the city a more complicated system. The more we're willing to engage in those confrontations, the richer the city becomes. Finally, I want to say to you the kind of three aspects of making the city, which, uh, just to underline what Ricky Burdett uh, said briefly in the film, about what is the maker's share in an open city. I think there are three in number. Porosity, synchronicity, and informality. <coughs> Porosity is the notion that places are open to a variety of people rather than gated. We have the techniques to, as planners and as architects to make porosity. In the planning realm, for instance, it's by focusing on the edges of cities, on the edges of communities or of spaces, rather than focusing on their centers. Where two different regions or groups of the city meet, that's much more important from the vantage point of porosity than uh, shoring up the identity in the centers of places. And this is something that actually we, uh, it, well, UNDP, which is a, another hat for all this, is trying to build up in places like Karachi. That is to get different confessional subgroups of Islam and different economic groups to uh, interact at their edges. So that's porosity. Porosity implicates building at the edge rather than building at the center. The second thing is synchronicity. And uh, this is a, uh, I'll give you an example of a project I'm deeply involved in. This is in Nehru Place in Delhi, which is an open air market, putting in schools and health clinics in the midst of basically uh, a kind of gray goods, i.e. stolen, electronics market, which serves all of Delhi. And a synchronous space is many things happening at once, many kinds of activities happening at once. So that, for instance, people who are ill, the same thing could happen in a shopping center here if you put a hospice in it or an AIDS clinic. You have at the same time people it, uh, experiencing quite different things. When we talk about mixity or mixed use, what we're usually thinking about is linear mixed use. During the day, X happens, and then at night, something else happens, right? This is, if you go to the city of London, you can find linear mixed use everywhere. The bankers are, are, are out there screwing the people during the day, and then at night the bars open and they're relieving their guilt or whatever. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what they do? Uh, but you understand what the principle of synchronicity is about. It is about many things happening at once. It's a way to open up the city. And finally, uh, we are interested in the informal realm, as you can see from the film, in a particular way of not, uh, in terms of incomplete form, about building forms of housing, schools, public services. Maybe it's time. Well, I tell you, we're interested in this. 
<laughs> so that is what the project of the Open City is about. Thank you very much. Right, so, um, yes, the future is urban, but I want to start with a rural. And the rural is today increasingly privatized. Large corporations own it. Certain governments own parts of it all over the world. And all of these dominant sectors, mining, big plantations, think of the timber industry, water grabs, not to mention the city service in Newtown, but let's just stick with the first four. All of those are expelling so people. Sorry. One of the few places left for the, the estimated three millions that every year are forced to leave wherever they are are the slums of big cities. <coughs> That's the first stop. After that, who knows? The result is that I think this will be the format of the near future. A jungle of high-rise, expensive buildings <coughs> and a massive zone which combines severe miseries at the edges, but not terribly bad stuff like this, what we in Latin America call la periferia, which is really happening all over the world. And if there isn't enough land, we're making them on water. I think these are the formats of the future. What's to be done? How can governments, citizens intervene? It's a tough one, but it lies on the agenda. We've got to deal with it. Now, Habitat. Serious organizations, serious leadership, they really try to do something. Look at this, they really wanted to better those slums. But all they could do because of legal issues is the streets, hoping in a way that the legality of the street and the cleanup of the street would sort of create a slight, if you want, legal shadow effect on the surrounding buildings. Of course, when the streets are that well designed, that wide, the tanks can also ride in them. So, you know, it's mezzo mezzo. The point I'm trying to make is how difficult it actually is to intervene <coughs> and make it better because a lot of that is irregular and the outcome might be that they will be thrown out because people are also being thrown out of the slums, as some of you know. Now, cities have long taken land. Clearly, they started by taking land. If you add the expansion of suburbs, gated communities, slums, etc., massive amount of land taken away from other uses. Today we have reached a very extreme moment. Now, over the last decade, we had a sort of new version of this notion of taking land, but it's happening in the center of cities, and that's different. It's not happening in rural areas. It keeps on happening in rural areas, but this is a different modality. Here are just some very quick figures. I'm looking at the top 100 cities working with data up till now of just the top 50. This is just one element of a much larger picture, which also invo involves building new buildings. This is just buying existing property. This is a year, one year, mid-2013 to mid-2014. And New York, number one, it, they love to do it to be number one, 55 billion, just buying property. London, you see, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for 20, okay, and this is just foreign acquisitions, right? So London there is number one. And you can see quite a variability. Look at Shenzhen, China, the rate of <laughs> growth. Shenzhen is number seven here, 426%. Look at Amsterdam Randstad. The Dutch just sort of a few years ago discovered, oh my God, this is happening here too. Uh, <laughs> 248%, so you see these different growth rates. I have the data for 2015, but I can't lay it out. But here are a few. When you look at the growth rates, you see how low they are. Beijing, for instance, that means 26% less than last year. Huh? It doesn't mean that they are demolishing buildings. No, they're still adding. It's just the growth rate. But look at <coughs> Nanjing. Nanjing, 142% increase. So you have enormous variability, but one pattern that we discern, this is a history of about 10 years. That, that we are capturing here. And the last few years are the moments of acute change. And what we are detecting is an expansion of, you might say, a kind of operational space 
for investment in properties. So more and more cities are becoming part. London, we're in London, I'll give you a bit on London. I, I got the figures for this. This is over 65,000 buildings bought by foreigners. And the, the year it, it, this is from 20 or 2005 to 2014. 65,000 buildings, you know, they're all big. That's not a minor event. Yeah. And of course, the decline in, in, in building housing is also, you see that in all these are different sectors. I don't want to delay on it, but you can see the slides later. Uh, now, if I take those 100 cities that I'm looking at and uh, the value of property investment, well, what they account for, let me start, 10% of the world population, 30% of the world's GDP. That's pretty significant. 76% of property investment. I emphasize <coughs> investment because this means the financializing. These properties could not account for that much if they were not financialized. In other words, there are two circuits. There is the circuit of the actual properties that get bought, etc., and then there is a second circuit, which is the circuit of finance, where it circulates and it can acquire <coughs> extraordinary valuations. According to Seville's, and they supposedly know their stuff, they go around the world sending <coughs> big property to big investors. Um, now, this is worldwide real estate. This is not the cities that I'm focusing on. Worldwide real estate assets, again, a financialized condition, are nearly 60% of the value of all global assets, including equities, bonds, and gold. This footnote, for those who are really interested in this, this excludes derivatives. You understand we're talking assets. So derivatives are an extraordinary yes, value. Yeah. It's a different circuit. But that, the total value is $217 trillion. That is more than the global GDP of all countries in the world, which is just under 200 trillion. So we're talking a significant event, not just in terms of the materialities of the buildings, but in terms of what the financial system can do with that. Now, what I, in looking at all of this, what I see is a very low utility function. A lot of these buildings, are underused, not always, but a lot of it. They're furthermore often bought by shell companies. Shell companies means that you're trying to hide who you are. The Panama Papers, those of you, <laughs> the darling Panama Papers. So look at this. These are properties in, in, in New York City. And mind you, they are grand. They aspire to being recognized. So it's a highly visible event at night we can see how much of it is dark. And here you have some of the elements. 122 of the 192 condos are owned by people who use shell companies that hid their identities. That's a very high share. This is a totally underutilized building. This is 57% of condos. This is the Bloomberg Tower. There's a whole such list. When you look at parts of Manhattan today, it's like a monoculture, a jungle of high towers underused. A lot of it is dark at night. Now, we might ask, why does all of this matter? And I think here we have to begin to crawl, if you want, into what is it about a city that we care? And one way of putting it, for me at least, given the kind of research that I do, is that the city is one of the places today where those without power actually gain complexity in their powerlessness, and they get to make a history, an economy, you know, a culture. Think of all the poor neighborhoods, they have a culture. When you think of urban space across the centuries, across the millennia, it has outlived, including the poor neighborhoods, all kinds of very powerful, you know, instances, whether that is governments, whether that is corporations, most of the big corporations that have existed across the centuries are dead. Most of the forms of government finished. But urban space, including the poor neighborhood, still is there. And that tells us something. You know, I don't know exactly what it is, but it is, it is something that, the, yeah. And so the other thing is the capacity of the city. And here I'm talking about a real city, not, you know, to make us all into urban subjects. 
most of the time. We're not urban subjects. We're a mother, we're a father, we're an employee, we are whatever. But the city makes us at particular moments. And, and for me, the, the, the image is, of course, the old bazaar. During the day when you were trading, your religion, whatever, didn't matter. At night, you went back to your neighborhood, which was a religiously specified neighborhood. Think of the old, but I'm talking old, old, huh? in Jerusalem, in Baghdad, etc. We don't have that today. But we have other ways in which that making us into urban subjects sort of comes into life. Now, I'm also interested in understanding what can we do. I have, for decades, I feel, like 70 decades, I exaggerate, I'm not that ancient. Uh, I have tried to somehow generate critiques about high finance, and I think of high finance as an extractive sector, unlike traditional banking. Traditional banking is commerce, we all need it. It sells money for a prize. That's fine. When a sector is extractive, so I say that, that finance might as well be mining. It extracts, and when it's done extracting, it's out of there. It doesn't care. Whereas the traditional bank, once the sons and daughters of whatever the families that are, the, the parents that are the clients, to do better, because that's the business. So this is, uh, to me, very significant. Now, in terms of how, and, and I've given up on finance. That is what I wanted to say. I've decided that <laughs> finance will destroy itself. <laughs> right now, high finance is a bit on the way down. It's lost standing, it's lost, it has grabbed, because it is extractive, it's like mining. It has sort of, it's losing ground within which to extract, which is to me a very interesting little element. It may completely reinvent itself again. But so, my focus now is, what can we do? Let finance self-destruct, what can we do? And here, here are just some elements, this is, this is actually, not an easy part, but I am involved in a whole variety of efforts, you know, sort of with other people around the world. And so one, one item that stands out for me is this notion of relocalizing what we can relocalize. As I said in the, in the film, you know, do we really need a multinational to have a cup of coffee in our neighborhood? I'm thinking of Starbucks. <laughs> we don't. Every time we use a franchise, we are actually ex allowing an actor far away, who knows where, to extract part of the consumption capacity of a locality and to send it to headquarters. We should not use the branches of international banks to do our local banking. We should find some sort of city bank or law. A uh, city bank is the wrong thing. I mean, <laughs> whatever the bank that a city may have, sort of more local operation, where you hope that it recirculates in the locality, that, that kind of thing. Now, when you begin to think about what can we relocalize, for me, again, one critical element is franchises. Out with a franchise. Now, we need a franchise to buy a computer. We don't need it for a lot of other things. And so you see elements in many parts of the world. And often in the <coughs> poor communities, they have been doing it all along because they can't afford the franchise, is to actually, you know, to relocalize production. The whole notion of urban agriculture that is, you know, it's an old story, mind you, in many cities in the global south, which also maintain connections with rural areas in a way that we in the global north don't. But, you know, there is work to be done. Then what we need sort of at the level of design and planning that not everything is geared towards the city center. We've just got to get out of that model. Now there are older cities that often have very strong neighborhood economies, it's, but you know, it's one way of thinking about it. The other element is be there. I am very keen, given the kind of work that I'm doing, which also includes some elements of the digital, how do we connect transversally across the world? Most of the people who live in cities are actually modest income people. The rich, you know, in some of our big cities now, the rich, you know, they are like 30% of the residents, and that shows. I always say, actually, that to focus on the 1% is a mistake. 
because you know they've always been there. Yeah, they're super rich. But when you take the 30% at the top, the real rich, real rich but not as rich as the 1%, they imprint themselves with their needs and their options and their power on urban space. That has really affected a lot of people. That 1% has long been there. They have their own way of using space, but it's not like 30% or in a city like New York or London, it's almost 40% who are very rich can use enormous spaces. So in that sense, the need for modest localities to actually connect transversally. Finally, a multi-sited horizontal <coughs> commons. The commons is meant to be horizontal, but very often they are not. Gaining strength from far and from near. Thank you very much. She's signaling, I have to end. Well, as long as I was. <laughs> As long as he was. So we've heard from Richard about the social, we've heard from Saskia about the financial and the political. Uh, I want to bring things back a little bit to the physical. Uh, I had forgotten how wonderful the film is and maybe a lot of what I was going to say at the beginning I can really rush through in order to leave space for uh, discussion. But um, I want to talk about the physical in the sense of not just what is there, but most importantly, what we can do. This is an issue for all of us involved in this wider project. So we've seen this hand of, uh, a male hand of Le Corbusier over Paris with his ideas of what to do. That's what we're now talking about. Um, the part of the world which is being urbanized in ways that Sassi has described because of the processes behind it is tending to take the same form, the same typology. Let's try and understand together what that means. And of course, it's not only there. And we saw again in the film, and it's useful to just remind ourselves, what was it that Le Corbusier was trying to do by killing the street, as he called it? Well, the street at that point was congested, it was dirty, it was airless. And that drawing on the far right on the bottom, which many architects admire, as many here were also trained with those images, was actually to do a very valuable thing to bring fresh air and daylight into people's homes. These ambitions are still there, but the reality of what's being built, boy, if he wanted to kill the street, he's succeeded. Just look at what's happening in Delhi on the left or Shanghai on the right. This is in the call to actually solve a significant problem that we've seen there. So these images that you've seen, you know, it sort of could be anywhere, but look at where they're happening. Look how different they are in terms of geographies cultures and actually positions in the cycle of urban change. Now, Jean Clos made it very clear in his talk, and part of his biggest project is that actually the real problem of cities today, and Saskia, very close to what you're saying, is not just the center. Cities are doubling, tripling, quadrupling in, in population, but most of them are sprawling beyond belief. They're becoming looser, and f more fragile at the edges. And those who can't, in a way, to afford to are being pushed out to the edge. 458% is what the number is amongst 200 cities in the last 25 years. But also that last figure, and this connects very much back to Wendy's point, bizarrely, as cities are expanding, the amount of real public space is actually diminishing, and we need to talk about that. Because this is what it's like. This is what actually is happening out there. The rural and the urban, which Saskia referred to, is typified by this image, but it could be elsewhere. So the question for all of us is how do you expand? How do you plan when you come to expand cities? Now this favorite image that maybe many of you have seen, I'm re-looking at as not the failures of the Charter of Athens, but what happens when you only get a third? of the Charter of Athens. In other words, we've seen the images here everywhere of what is that stuff on the right. That's the plan bit. That's the easy bit. It's not great, but that's plan. You have the infrastructure, but it's the rest and how the three don't actually connect. In fact, they work against each other, which is what is important. And the issue of density in public space is fundamental. These two images, believe it or not, are exactly the same scale. Right? This is Cairo and Barcelona. These were at one level designed and one level uh, planned in order to deal with the same issues. Just look at the size of the space. 
and think of all the issues that Richard talked about in terms of spaces of interaction. We don't know, need to go into this, but this wonderful drawing done several hundred years ago, it happens to be of a city uh, of Rome, captures in white, while the other buildings are, while the buildings are in black, everything that is accessible at different times of day or night for different institutions, different peoples, and different organizations. So I think one of the things for us in terms of this process of the Quito Papers is to relearn in the contemporary age how to do this without getting all sort of romantic about the past, particularly if you happen to be like me, someone who was brought up in Rome. This is what's being built. Imagine a nolly plan of this. It would not be the same. It would be completely monolithic. It would not allow for children to play in that central space, which is called the central play space. <laughs> now, what are the examples to look at? Very simple. Most of you in the room know it, but why do I repeat Barcelona? Because Barcelona did, 150 plus years ago, exactly what Lagos is trying to do, exactly what Jakarta and other cities are trying to do, exactly what London is trying to do. You see here what the medieval city was like, and it had to expand four, five, six, seven times. And that is the well-known image of the Serda plan. The most important point for those of us looking at this image is the fact that actually it's changed over time. What Serda thought about has had to be modified and had to completely accept different types of social uh, organizations, different types of people, young people, old people, people from different parts of the world, and of course, different political regimes. So the ability to adapt to change is fundamental. I don't want to give the impression in the work that we've been doing that we don't believe in planning. I believe strongly in planning. I believe in good planning. It's very straightforward. And they're wonderful examples. If you take Copenhagen with this famous finger plan, it served the city incredibly well. It's not perfect in terms of sustaining growth over the last 40, 50 years since it was invented. At the heart of this are things that are missing in the Charter of Athens, which is linking transport growth with density, with complexity, and with social cohesion. That's why I'm going to stick my neck out. I believe in the London plan, whether it was actually done by Ken Livingston, by Boris Johnson, and now being revised by Sadiq Khan. Why do I believe in it? Because it holds one thing, very clear from this diagram, the green belt stop the city from growing, and then emphasize, invest in those hot spots where there is good public transport and opportunity. We've heard that these things go wrong from Saskia's figures. Not everything is perfect, I stress. But if you adhere to a number of principles, you can get things right. And again, I want to use one or two examples, controversial in London, of course. The London Olympics was a site which you see on the left. There are so many sites like this that we recognize. And we have a choice of the what to do with it. The Charter of Athens gave us a menu, and we could have followed that, and in this case, we haven't. London has learned, as other Western and cities of the global north have understood, that you need to make cities at least more complex, in, and not in one go. So the image, the sort of juicy image on the right-hand side, is something that might or might not happen. But what are the ingredients? Very, very simple here. This is what the site was like in 2005, very large, broadly empty site, with one route through it. A very large part of the Olympics budget was spent in making 37 different links, bridges, cycleways, and everything else. Again, it's not a perfect place, but it allows for the potential of what Richard was talking about before. By the way, not unlike the rest of London. This is exactly how London has grown over the years. The different estates have grown together, and this is how this part of London will change over time. I'm not defending the uh, housing system, which doesn't allow for social, real social housing or public housing to be built. I'm defending the framework which accepts that places will change over time, and you're not trying to make one community in one moment and fixed in time like this one. There are other examples. In um, Hamburg, the old city, which you see in the back, has been reconnected to a new evolving area. 
At the heart of it is exactly what Le Corbusier wanted to kill, the street. It's a beginning, it's not perfect. At the end of it is the Elbe Philharmonie, which opened the other day. So mixity here and uh, porosity are at the center. Wendy talked about public space. I don't need to repeat that. We don't have time. But these are exactly the same issues in New York, in Istanbul. And we've learned from our colleague Raul Mirota about the importance of thinking what can happen in these spaces at different times of day of night. You can have a cricket game in this space or you can have a celebration or it can be just empty at times. But it has to have that capacity. This is what we've learned by looking and studying many of the positive examples in Latin America where you place not just um, uh, cable cars to get up the hill in difficult places, but you put libraries where these places stop. That's what begins to make the grains of the more integrated city that we're interested in. So while before and started with sort of more <coughs> negative examples of what's happening in terms of the cookie cutter Charter of Athens type of development, it's interesting to see that Addis Ababa has started investing in actually light rail. That can lead to exactly the sort of complexity uh, and density and porosity that we've done here. And the last word for the private sector. I think we have to be careful in criticizing too much that anything which comes from private sector doesn't work. We need to provide the, with the public sector eyes the planning that I've been talking about. And I think it's interesting that just in London, a development which is worth two billion, three billion, in fact, uh, pounds of private development has at least tried to play the game of streets, of connectivity, uh, and of different uses. Again, it's not perfect, but I want to, in a way, remind ourselves that there are other possibilities of creating urban space which are different to the Charter of Athens principles. Those principles were about dispersal and separation, about, as Saskia said, de-urbanizing and making places impermeable, the tabula rasa. And I think, in many ways, what we're trying to talk about the film makes it very clear that trying to design cities around density and complexity, making them porous and adaptable, but also think of them as things that have to change over time and uh, uh, adapt and make cityness, as Saskia calls it, is at the heart of what we need to do for cities. Thank you very much. We are a little short bit um, um, Let's go straight to short the form, of huh? time. Yeah, let's go to the, um, let's go to questions. And, yeah. yeah, I mean what I thought, that I, I'd like to start just with one question for all three of you and then, and then we can move into, to, and open it up to the audience here. Okay, so I mean I think one of the things that's very interesting about the, the Charter of Athens is in a way the de they designed what they were able to design. And certainly when we look at it today, we can see that these are things that have a, a fairly straightforward um, way of proceeding in terms of planning and design. Now, two of the things that stand out very, very strongly today uh, that were not in the Charter of Athens, um, but that are very important for us, have to do with public space and inequality. And between the three of you, you've, you've Covered talked that. about those <laughs> a lot. But what I'm wondering is, are we looking at a qualitative change today where our cities are so different um, and that design and planning does not have a straightforward answer? I mean, Ricky, this, this is something that, that you might want to dire um, address directly, but I think you know, the question of, of complexity um, is very important. I think inequality, Saskia, which you've been talking about, all of these things, um, because we're, we're looking at something that is very complex and moving very quickly, it's difficult. And I'd just like to hear from each of you a few words about you know, designing and planning today. What does that look like in, in these terms? Well, it depends where you are in the world, mm -hmm. and it depends yeah. at what point of that cycle of change you're talking about. In Africa, at the moment, between 60 and 70 percent of urban growth is totally informal, planning doesn't exist, and we have the situations that we've seen, uh, and therefore one has to, in a way, reinvent how that tool can actually work. In Western planning doesn't exist. Pardon? Western planning doesn't necessarily uh, exist. No, that's a fair point. 
I mean, that, that is a, a, a fair point. Uh, but planning in the sense that perhaps infrastructure of all sorts, what happens in, un, under, underground in terms of providing water and electricity, uh, what happens in terms of basic services like schools, health, and everything. In that sense, that is not planned. So, but I, I, I take that, uh, that point. Uh, elsewhere, as we've seen, say, in the Latin American context, but also uh, in other places, there is the relearning of what to do with uh, an infrastructure which is ill. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the whole notion of retrofitting, I think, is a very different way of actually dealing with, uh, with uh, the ill urban body. And then there's the planning literally anew, which actually is a tiny percent of where people are either living now or will be living. Most people moving into places which are, have been there for hundreds of years, if not more than that, except rather than build ex novo. Good. Saskia? You on the inequality? Well, it's growing. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But so it, it seems to me that one format that I'm very intrigued by, and we have seen that in some countries, like in Singapore, in the Netherlands a bit, which is that you create only mixed neighborhoods, right? So that you have rich, middle, and poor. The super rich, forget about that. So that is a problem in big cities in New York where you have 30% of those so fancy that forget about it. But you know, your average rich, whatever that means today in what. And, and that you actually, because I think that what happens, what I have witnessed in Latin America where I grew up and have witnessed uh, in, in, in the United States, which is a bit of a third world country in many ways, is, <laughs> is a kind of real degradation that is very profound in poor neighborhoods. They are, they are also, they are, you also see neighborhoods where they fix it up. But if one could mix it, so that to me is one very important mm -hmm. issue. Secondly, um, the extractive logic that dominates our period is such that we have an absolutely savage shift of income and wealth to the top. Finance has been a critical instrumentality here. That stuff doesn't fall from the sky ready-made. You know, it is made. It is made. So it's not the only format that we can have. I do think that your average politician, your average resident, your av whether poor or, or rich uh, or modest rich, uh, needs to begin to understand what are the systems that are messing up our cities and our lives to such an extent. We cannot delegate to the experts because the experts have their own version. You know, I, I think we need m to mobilize on the knowledge vector. But you do, yeah. you need so some. We need some experts. You need, you need some yes. understanding of where the city is going to go. I mean, otherwise, don't no, I, mean, I mean, that's what planning and design is about, no, is, no. is having some expertise. Sure, sure. But, um, but I mean, on the social question, you know, we really, we, there has to be an, an informing and educating of just about everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody should understand what are the mechanisms that are extracting, 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 and leaving so, so many people impoverished. I do think that that can be done. Good. Yeah, OK, okay. sorry. Can you plan for complexity? Well, I would say when I, th uh, to me, the, uh, uh, since I'm interested in sort of bottom-up community uh, 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 planning, the thing that is puzzling to me today is how people will work with high-tech, uh, smart city technology, big data, and so on, in a bottom-up way to plan. It's all designed to be very top-down. And the future to me in my bailiwick is how to reverse that process to make, uh, to make it a tool for people to plan bottom up. It does impact on this question of knowledge. It's, uh, many of these, these tech tools are absolutely opaque to people who are not tech savvy. And the UN, UNDP is organizing a whole set of of experimental projects to figure out how, how we can reverse that so that bottom-up planning can be inclusive of high-tech. Good, okay, thank you. All right, hopefully that's given you a bit of time to think about <laughs> questions and comments, and can I invite, yes? Wait, wait, wait for the mic.
Hello? Okay. Ah. So, because we had a little... Sorry, could you just say who you are? Um, I'm Antonella, and uh, yeah, I live in London. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so, I would like to make it quite <laughs> local. So, um, Saskia Sonia said about the way to look forward is about relocalized. But I quite what we can relocalize. Eh? What we can relocalize. But I feel quite disillusioned about, especially in London, where we just see this trend about regeneration that has been going on all across London. I live in Seven Sister in Tottenham, and uh, this is what is happening. Like communities breaking down, they want to destroy a lovely market. If you go to the Seven Sister Haringey Council, you see like. Uh, the regeneration plan replaced with a nice uh, um, pizza express and now is actually a place where there is a place for small business business and a place where the community hangs out so I'm just my question is what can we do i've been part of the consultation we've been writing to mp as a people in the city what can we do to kind of uh, uh -huh. go against this good okay thank you well, I would say the big trick in London, the big deception, is community consultation. And the word consultation is very different from the word co-production. And what, what I think is really dishonest in London, I mean, I've just become a citizen, so I can say this. Please so free to criticize. Uh, yeah. So what's dishonest it's about true. this, the planner will bring in a project, everybody will bellyache, it will be taken under advisement, lessons will be learned, and the same plan goes forward. So I think you have a horrible democratic deficit in London, but it's local. That is, it's not because it's central planning doing this to you, it's those 33 boroughs, the way in which planning proceeds in each one of them. So I'm not so upset by the local versus the urban. What I'm upset by is the way the planning power and the planning process operates in the city. It's a lie, you know? And uh, that's why co-production is so important. That instead of consulting on a plan, you make it. Right, right, I like Good. that. Do you want to add to that? Ricky, no, Saskia, all right. There's work to be done, in other words, to your answer. Okay, right at, right at the back there. You, you, with your hand up, yes. Ask us a question. Hello, uh, my name is Pablo, I'm from UCL. Um, my question goes particularly to what uh, Ricky Bardet um, understands as an open city, and it's a question about if we define an open city as a mixed community uh, with defined streets and diverse and vibrant, uh, so if we put that in a charter, w are we maybe making the same mistakes as the Athens Charter in, in terms of its imposing something? For example, um, particularly like in the 90s, we've seen a lot of social housing that's been demolished because they were saying that modernis is bad, modernism is bad. So they were being replaced automatically with kind of like what they call mixed communities with other kind of tenants and, and other kind of uh, streets and even kind of a historicist approach to what they understand a neighborhood should be? Well, the, the simple answer to your question is that there is no charter. Uh, and um, I will refer to the fact that the, the document that uh, Richard and Jean Claus have edited will be coming out uh, at the, in September of this year, but a preview is possible as a result of, uh, from tonight, <laughs> which you can see on the LSE City's website. But what you will find in answer to your question is that there isn't a charter because completely agree with your principle, your point, sorry, that if you start laying down some rules, uh, they're too fixed and they don't uh, actually respond to the changing nature of society and uh, particularly in different parts of the world. I think what you've heard from us today is basically a series of values. And I think reintroducing the notion that the physical form itself represents some f form of value social value, exactly. or most importantly can frustrate it mm. through enclosure, through enclaving, which is what we're seeing in so many parts of the world, is exactly all you can do at this point. 
And therefore, it is a sort of awareness raising through education in the widest sense of the world that there is a connection there, and it's a very fragile one, and you need to understand it and not codify it. Yes. Um, this lady here. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Paola, and I gradu graduated from the Urban School of uh, Sciences Po Paris. Um, and my question is about um, when, Saskia, you were talking about Manhattan, um, where you have a lot of foreign uh, corporate buying uh, that is de-urbanizing the, um, right. the, the, the whole neighborhood. Um, if you compare it, for example, to Paris, where, where you have La Défense, which is a place where you have concentrated offices, um, is it a more desirable um, you know, example or model, assuming that they are actually very different? How do you see it? Right, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, the, the, there is a third issue in the case of Paris, which is so much of central Paris. It's also so expensive that you have far fewer people now living there in a way. You have more shops, etc. But otherwise, in principle, the idea of la défense, uh, if you're going to have an overwhelming number of towers, etc., with office, for office work, is not totally bad. But that would mean that the center of the city is truly a live center of the city where many people live with many different income levels. And that in central Paris you don't have either. That has diluted a bit. So, you know, the, the horror in Manhattan is also all those underutilized towers. I don't have anything against towers. But there is a kind of tower, you know, which is dark at night, which is basically about buying urban land rather than... That is, I think, a negative. Density can be, like, you, we made some experiments, you know, how you can achieve considerable You're density right. and still keeping a lot of central, uh, you know, sort of li space where people can do things. Yeah. So, so it's, it's really, it's how the city itself is organized. So the case of Paris, I think La Défense is not a bad idea, though it is a desert at night, mostly, huh? I mean, it's okay. It's office work, you know. Why should the low wage workers only have to do a long trip to the center of the city? Let the rich workers also go out of the city to do their job and then come back at night, you know, wherever they live. So anyhow, it's sort of that kind of mix of elements. Yeah, I, I would say it's it's not sheer density that's the problem. It's how a city is dense. Yeah. Yes. And. Um, um, so you know, I'm not so convinced actually by these. You, you know, the worry that uh, Joan Close has that cities are becoming less dense and, and so on. It depends uh, how they're, be if they're decentralizing in good ways, that's great. But so, La Défense is not very urban, by the way. I'm not, sorry, I didn't mean to yeah, interrupt you. But I'm just saying it, we make a big error in equating urbanity with density. It's, mm, right. it, exactly. yes, it's right. not how it works. All right, I think we're... It was a um, question. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I think what's happening is that we're getting right to the end of, of, of the time. Sure so one more. what I'd like to do is just take a few questions and then ask the speakers to address the points that they feel able to. So there was w one person over here. Yes, uh, my name's Robert Hutchison. I used to be a city councillor in Winchester, the oh, yes. ancient capital. Uh, my question is... is um, are there any really good examples of where land value taxation actually produces a good public realm, you know, mm -hmm. it's done mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. All right, I think there was one at the back. Yes, please. Yeah. Hello, I'm Sebasti. I'm, my background is in architecture and urban planning, but I'm currently working on issues of uh, the evolution of powers within the government model and community empowerment. So I was very intrigued by the contribution of uh, Saskia Sassen, and I found lots of good food for thought there. Um, and I was actually thinking to this uh, introduction that Mrs. Pullen uh, did about the future being urban and that we cannot question it. But I'm wondering whether we should start questioning whether the future is urban, because many of the people that we find in these big cities, they have also been extracted 
and they are completely alienated by their environments. So if we are to localize power, wouldn't it also be to get interested as urban planners on rural environments? Mm. Good, good question. Fine. Who else? One more. Yes, please. One more. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Jeremy Dalton. I am from Portland, Oregon, uh, but I am with an organization called Travel Spirit. I really appreciated your thoughts on the, the Athens Charter and how we have a uh, what was initially seen as a very pro-democratic uh, technology that really enabled uh, this, this kind of change and this shift in the way that we organized our cities. Um, and yet we didn't really foresee the side effects and foresee the consequences uh, and that actually led to less changes. It seems that maybe we are at a similar crossroads today or a similar place today in regards to uh, open data and or, or big data and ubiquitous access to mobile phones and mobile technology and how maybe we can avoid making similar mistakes. Good. All right. Anything from over on that side of the room? No, no, let's we should good. end because okay. they get very... Um, Ricky, do you want to start? No, no. Richard, do you want to start? Well, I just uh, uh, say to you about this that the issue of a smart city is not just an issue about application, but about the construction of smartness itself. And um, uh, it's, it's a, it, you know, we always think about the smart city as an application. Uh, of existing technology. It's a generator of a different kind of technology. If we really had democratic smart cities, the handheld, for instance, would work very differently than it works now. The idea of menuing, uh, of menus and featuring would have to be revised. So this is an interactive process between space and technology. If you take that one. Okay, um, the land values, the taxation, etc. I, I have the impression that London, for a while, actually functioned rather well. But then you had sort of an outside factor entering into the picture, which really begins in the 1980s, eh, which, where the city of London was the heart at that point. So, so I think it varies, but I'm sure it's a very good question, and I'm going to put one of my researchers onto it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Come back next year. Come back. And Come then we'll give you year. an answer. Uh, Come back next year. Ah, uh, la señora, no? Yes. Um, so, so, yes, I mean, look, these are all very complicated issues, frankly. Huh? But I do think that we need to work at changing. I believe that we have lived for the last 30 years in the West, in the West, huh? uh, in a, in, w with a sort of a decaying political system, a political system that worked Med, no, a bit at least, after World War II, it said, in the 1980s when we privatize and deregulate and go global, that system really collapses. And it's a decaying, and Trump for me is exhibit number one, sort of, of that deep decay, and a few other people which I will not mention because we're in other countries. So I, I do think we need foundational changes. And I want to add something. I've spent a lot of time in, in, in one book that, that took me a lot of time to write. Uh, how do complex systems change? They do not change by changing everything. They often change by shifting capabilities developed for time one where they may have worked to mm. another kind of organizational format. And it can be quite invisible. It doesn't mean that you, you, know, you start from scratch. And I think that is what I see. The, um, the apps, whoever. So I am very intrigued in, I want to give you one example of missed opportunities in cities. Number one, I think we should open source all the neighborhoods, connect them to central governments. The grandmother, the child, the homeless person, they all have knowledge about the city. Number two, every, I am particularly interested in poor and modest neighborhoods. Every modest neighborhood should have some sort of digitalized uh, element where they know about the knowledges of the residents in their neighborhood, not the jobs they have. I know doctors and lawyers who are waiting to, have to become regular immigrants who are working as parking lot attendants, but the low-income neighborhood should know, we have a doctor, we have a lawyer, even if they come from other countries. You know, that kind of utility functions that are very simple where the digital 
can really make the difference. Yeah, I mean, just on that point, enough has been said. I mean, the sharing economy has made a complete difference to the way cities are being used. And, mm. But just to, I think, to take the point about um, uh, tax, but not to answer it uh, uh, in a technical <laughs> way, uh, but to reflect on the fact that in the end, what you do with cities is a cultural and ethical statement. So I think you can have all sorts of taxing regimes, but in the end, it's a, it is a uh, question of values. And the heart of that is one of the issues that I think we're very concerned is who owns that land. So uh, at a simple level, I'll never forget the great um, right. Barcelona architect, Oriol Bojigas, who uh, wrote 30, 40 years ago, he said, you know, it, okay, bring in the private sector, whatever, but we, the city, have to own the streets. If we don't own the streets, right. mm -hmm. and in the end, uh, again, going back to the, to the, um, the way that the ownership of the Olympic Park is actually uh, organized is significant. A decision was made, given there was so much public money of those of us who pay taxes in this country uh, pay, uh, paid for it. The freehold, the ownership in perpetuity of that land is in the public sector. It's Fantastic. In, it's, it, you know, that, it, that cannot change. You can sell, uh, you can lease for 99 years or more the actual buildings, but the freehold uh, remains in the hands of the mayor's uh, uh, legacy uh, uh, um, um, organization, as it's called today. So I would have thought at the heart of that question, not just where does right. the money, who, how do you raise the money, but where does the money go and who controls it to keep these values of porosity, accessibility, uh, and democracy actually alive. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, I'm afraid that, we've reached know? the end of the evening, know. the end of our time. Thank you very much. <laughs>